Welcome back to our lecture. In the previous segment, I talked about automation and how we can use automation to build a code pipeline. We use code pipelines to, to automate the delivery of software code to our customers. It enables a constant flow of change. And so when you're building out a software pipeline, it, the first stage of that pipeline is really important because your code enters the pipeline and then it will be promoted through various stages and ultimately into a production environment. In a DevOps organization, oftentimes we use a process called continuous integration in order to push our code into the code pipeline. And continuous integration is a practice which has really been around for a couple decades now. It, it emerged in the late 90s, early 2000s as part of the extreme programming movement, the XP movement. And if, if you go back in time and look at traditional software organizations, traditionally, developers would merge their code changes once a day, and they would perform a nightly build. And the goal was they, they didn't want to break that build, you know, because everybody would be working on changes all day long, and then all those changes would culminate in this single build that would be performed. And, and if that build broke, then invariably the software developers were stuck, you know, sitting around, uh, sometimes into the evening, trying to fix that build and, and get it working again. And so, like, the last thing you wanted to do was break the build late on a Friday afternoon because then you might be stuck there uh, for a while and, you know, you, you'd have a late start to your weekend. And developers, when they're making code changes, uh, generally, like, different teams would be working on separate long-running feature branches and then when everybody was done working on their features after a, a, you know, a couple months, they would try to merge all that code together into a single you know, mainline branch and, and a single master build. And inevitably, they would, they would encounter what we call merge hell when trying to merge all those code changes together uh, months later. Continuous integration really mitigates uh, all of these issues. And in a continuous integration practice, developers are checking in their code at least once a day. And when they're checking in their code to a repository, they're checking in that code to a master branch, a mainline branch. So think of it like all the developers in the organization are pushing code changes to the same branch. They're not, they're not these, they're not, their code changes aren't living in separate uh, branches which have to be integrated later. All of their code is constantly being integrated into a single branch. And every single time a developer checks their code into the mainline branch, a, that initiates a code pipeline. And the first thing that the code pipeline is gonna do is it's going to perform some unit testing on their code. It's going to uh, actually build their code if they have to, have to compile the, their code and produce some output artifacts. Everybody in the organization, all the developers, can see the results of that build process. It's very transparent. And your understanding as a developer is that once you commit your code to that mainline branch, your code is on a fast train that's heading to production land. In other words, the code that you commit may at some point, and, and, and depending on how quickly you release uh, your code into production, that, co that code could be deployed into production. It's, it's so... All that code that you're you're producing um, is going to be ultimately deployed to production. 
any of the code artifacts which are produced, those sort of deliverables are going to be stored in some sort of artifact or repository. And those artifacts will be promoted throughout the code pipeline and, and, and deployed to various environments like, like test environments and, and staging environments, ultimately a production environment. Here's a sort of a diagram showing how this continuous integration process works. You have developers on the left side that are working on code on their local workstations, and they're writing uh, unit tests. They will then continuously integrate that code in the version control system, and they're committing their code and merging it into a mainline branch. So all the, the developers are constantly integrating their code with one another and all pushing code to the same branch. Every time a developer commits code, that will initiate a build process. And those builds can, can happen in parallel. So uh, you have, uh, like in a, in a Git system, you would have developers that are are pushing, they're committing code, they're pushing it to an upstream repository in a shared master branch, and they're initiating pull requests. So these are requests to, to merge their code into the master branch. Every time they create a pull request, that will automatically initiate a code pipeline where the code that they want to merge is going to be unit tested and linted, the, the code will be, the software will be built, artifacts will, will be generated, um, and, and they might perform some manual testing as, as well. But the, the key here is that you can have multiple software pipelines that are running in parallel, and the software is then promoted to those pipelines at, um, you know, at different rates and, and, and the software is at various stages. Once your code has been committed to the pipeline, as I said, it goes through that initial unit testing and build process. From there, the code is going to be promoted through various testing phases. And we automate this process. And the, the, the idea is that as our, as our code progresses through, you know, through, through a sequence of stages, our code is, is, is providing us with, uh, we're, get, we're gaining greater assurance that our code actually works and is, is going to work in a production environment. You can think, about, think of it as the closer our code gets to production as it progresses through the pipeline, uh, the, the greater assurance that we have that the code is actually working. Now, one of the challenges that companies face is, is how to automate the testing of their software code. I, I think that this tends to be the, the sort of the most challenging and oftentimes most inefficient part of the software delivery process. And one of the problems that companies face when they're performing testing is that they're testing the wrong way. They're focusing their testing efforts on trying to discover defects in their software code versus preventing those defects from getting into the software delivery pipeline in the first place. And once again, DevOps methodology borrows some of the lessons learned from Lean. And uh, Edwards Deming, who is kind of like one of the, the grandfathers of the Lean movement, and, and one of the first people to really describe Lean, what he said with respect to testing processes is that companies need to cease their dependence on inspection in order to achieve quality companies can essentially eliminate the need for inspection by building quality into the product. And, and that's where 
things like Six Sigma come from and, and uh, the, the, this notion of Kaizen, continuous improvement. Companies really focus on decreasing defects in their manufacturing process and increasing yield so that instead of having to spend all this time and effort on trying to determine whether or not their product is defective as it comes out, you know, off the end of the production line, they, instead they focus their time and effort on producing quality product in the first place. And the same is true in, in software development. In, in a modern software development organization that's implementing DevOps practices, we adopt this shift left sort of alignment in our testing processes. And our goal is to essentially test our software code earlier in the delivery life cycle instead of testing our software at the very end of the life cycle. If you recall, uh, if you, you know, from your software engineering uh, learnings, the, the sooner that we can find defects and quality issues in our code, the easier it is to, to remediate those issues. It's easier uh, to, to figure out and, and, you know, it's easier for the developer to remember the code that they wrote. Uh, it, it's, it's cheaper. It's, it's much less expensive um, to have to perform that sort of rework. And so in a DevOps organization, we attempt to shift left and, and, and do most of the, of the testing up front versus much later in the uh, software uh, d delivery process. Well, so how do we shift left? Um, one of the ways to do that is by investing in the right sort of testing. And what you'll find oftentimes, especially in traditional organizations, is that when, they, when they're automating their testing process, they tend to implement what we call the uh, ice cream cone anti-pattern, which is which you'll see on the left side of this diagram. You'll see companies that have a limited amount of unit testing, and they'll have um, you know more more investment in acceptance and integration testing, and then the vast majority of their automation effort is focused on things like UI tests. And, and, then, and then they'll also have a large number of tests which haven't been automated yet and have to be performed manually. Uh, and, and why is this an anti-pattern? By the way, I see this all the time. I, 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 a, a number of years ago, I worked with a company that had a software platform and they had like virtually zero unit tests, almost almost none. And I, I, I you know, I, I think their software developers really didn't like building unit tests. Um, and and so and then and then they had a, a, a limited number of of integration level tests that were automated, and then they had literally thousands of UI tests that were automated and they, they had outsourced the creation of their UI automation tests to a, a team in India that was like working full time around the clock, uh, constantly churning out more and more UI tests. The result is that it, it, the, their, their automated testing process literally took over 48 hours, like two days running continuous UI tests. And if you know anything about UI tests, it's, it's it, you know, they're, they're, they're sort of like, um, a, a, I think of them as being a very low reward test in the sense that they are awfully brittle. Every time you make software changes, you're breaking UI tests because you're moving UI elements around, you're renaming things. Uh, they're very brittle. They're, they're very ex expensive to maintain. Um, they're also, in many cases, non-deterministic, and, and, uh, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a bit. And so they'll, they'll give you, um, oftentimes give you lots of false positives and, and potentially even, even false negatives. 
And as a result, what what will happen is that teams will, you know, they'll run their automated test suite and they'll be happy if like 90% of their tests succeed. And and they'll they'll call it a day and say, okay, our software's working if if 90% of, of the, the tests succeed, which in in my mind is a total failure. I mean, if any if any single test fails, th- that could be significant. It could be a, a test that's being performed on some critical flow within your your software platform and um, and, and you know you should be catching those those sort of the, the sort of defects. And if you're sort of conditioning your team to expect that 10% of your tests are always going to fail, um, then you're gonna you're gonna let defects slip through your software uh, delivery pipeline. And and again and and also just the time it takes to run these tests. They're they're expensive from a from a time standpoint. If your goal is to be able to release software changes quickly to your customers, then how can you expect to do that if your automated UI tests alone take two days? That's it's not going to happen. You'll never be able to, to uh, deploy features within a single day. And then some people, some people might, might say, well, you know, well, we don't really care about the ability to deploy software, you know, every, you know, like multiple times a day. We only need to really deploy our software once a week or once a month or, or whatever. And then my response to that is fine. You know, that's, that's fine if you want to, you know, follow a slower software delivery cadence. But what happens when you have a critical failure in production? You have code there that's not working as expected, some new massive defect that's been found. Maybe it's a zero-day security vulnerability, and you need to be able to remediate that quickly. How are you going to do that if your testing process alone takes two days? It's, it's, it, and so you're, you're essentially, by, by producing a software delivery process which is incredibly slow, you are putting your organization at significant risk because you are no longer in a position to be able to quickly remediate production issues. On the right-hand side of this diagram, we see what we call the ideal test automation pyramid. In the ideal test automation pyramid, the company is, is investing most of its testing effort and energy at the unit testing and at the acceptance integration testing stage. And, and these tend to be sort of like you, uh, like API level tests, uh, and of course in uh, unit tests, unit tests run remarkably quickly. You can run thousands of unit tests in an application in in seconds, and and API tests also tend to um, to work very quickly. And and the good thing is that they're generally not very brittle either. You're not changing your API as often or your API is versioned. And by investing time and effort in the API level testing, then you are also validating the API contract. You, you, you might also have some UI tests, but you have relatively few automated UI tests. And these are generally just, te- these are sort of end-to-end tests where you are, you are testing some of the most critical workflows. And you're not going to maintain many UI tests because, again, these, are, these g- generally are very brittle tests. You also may have uh, some manual and exploratory testing. Uh, you know, this idea that you can automate all testing um, you know, in some cases you can do that, but it, it generally is a real challenge. That generally there is there's some level of testing that is still performed manually uh, because there are certain things that only a human being can can really see. For example, usability. How would you automate usability testing? A, a machine doesn't really know if something is usable or not. And that's more of a human concept. And so you might have some manual testing in place just to test for usability. Here's an example of an ideal test pyramid where we have this Java application that has 
over 1,700 unit tests. It has 273 uh that's uh, these are sort of integration uh, level tests and acceptance tests, 24 integration tests. And finally, it only has 12 UI tests. So this is, you know, the sort of ratio that you might think about when building out your automated testing process. And again, m most traditional organizations I, I've worked with, their automated testing does not look like this today. It's that that inverted you know, ice cream cone anti-pattern. And, and you've got a lot of companies out there They've and traditional software development leaders that have invested so much of their time and effort in building out UI level testing that is really slow, really brittle and fragile, and the, that is non-deterministic and, and ultimately is not actually providing value. Um, and so th there's a it, it it this is an area where it takes a lot of work and a lot of convincing to get those traditional software leaders to start investing in a a, a better uh, test automation pattern. I mentioned earlier that you know there are a number of reasons why our DevOps organizations will shift left in, and it reduces, it improves quality and reduces costs. Uh, these are just some, some numbers that are, are, were pulled from, you know, some software engineering studies, uh, a, a study that was done uh, at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, where they're trying to figure out, like, you know, if we, if we find a, a defect at an earlier stage of our code delivery process, how does that impact the amount of time and effort required to remediate it? And you can see that if you're able to identify a defect during the sort of unit testing and build process, it might take a developer only three hours to fix versus if you've deployed that defects into production, it could take, take the developer 14 hours to fix that same defect at, at a much, much greater cost. And I know from my personal experience in working in software development, the fact is that I, I hardly recognize the code that I wrote even just a month ago. I, I, I've had cases where I've had to look at code that I wrote six months prior and I didn't even realize that I, I, I was the one that actually wrote that code. It looked so unfamiliar to me. And, and, and that's what happens in the software delivery process. As an as a engineer and developer, we're constantly focused on the work that we're doing today and the new features and defects that we're, that we're you know, working on. And that code that's been deployed into production, that's, that's long out of our mind. And, and, and so the, there's, it's, a, it's expensive to make that context switch and, and, and do rework on code that we have worked on in the past. I want to talk a little bit more about the, the UI testing. And, and, and you know, I've, I've mentioned before that so many companies invest all their time and energy in trying to automate UI testing. And they do it using tools like the popular Selenium framework. And this is a framework that you can use to, to, to sort of simulate web browser access to applications. So you, can, you actually write a test that leverages a web browser and automates a web browser, uh, the, 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 uh, automates a, and simulates a user that's accessing a web application using a web browser and clicking on, on you know, different links in the application and filling out forms with content and so on. Now, when you're, when you're creating these UI tests, these, these tests are, they're slow to create. They are really expensive to maintain because every time a, a developers make changes to the application, then you know, then a whole set of tests also need to be changed to align with the the new look of the website or the f the flow of functionality in the site. And they're non-deterministic. What do I mean by non-deterministic? Well, what I mean is that you could write one of these Selenium tests and 
90% of the time it will work, and then 10% of the time it won't. And why doesn't it work? Well, it doesn't work because the, the workflow that it's following, is it has some asynchronous components and and you know it's a cloud-based platform and so sometimes the you know the queries that are done on resources like databases they they might not come back um, as quickly as you would expect maybe your application's not implementing retry logic and, and and there's some temporary failure i mean there's all kinds of reasons why uh, 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 the environment might be performing differently, or, or you know, there could be, there could be timing issues. There could be like um, race issues within the application, and and these can ultimately impact the results from uh, tests. And so, if you run an automated test suite that's got a thousand UI tests in it, then you're going to have dozens of those tests that will fail on any given test run that you do. And, and so what, what the companies will do is they'll set sort of a threshold and they'll say like, okay, if, if 92%, if we get at least 92% of our tests passing during this automated test run, then we will consider the test run to be successful. Well, that's, that's a big problem because these, these non-deterministic UI tests are really dangerous um, because, you know, you're going to have false positives which pop up and people are going to look at these false positive tests and, and, and realize that, you know, they, um, they really weren't test failures. And that's ultimately going to be uh, lead to a, a alarm fatigue. And people are going to get de sort of desensitized to the fact that tests are failing. Over time, they're just going to be like, oh, well, you know, 10% of our tests always fail. So, so therefore, 90% of our tests passing, that, that's an acceptable result. Well, imagine, you know, you were an engineer working for Boeing and you were performing some critical testing on in a, a flight system and that flight system were, you know, it passed 90% of the time. Uh, would you feel confident in that system? Would you want to fly on that plane? So, you know, why, why are companies comfortable accepting failure and, and, and accepting these non-deterministic tests? Why are they comfortable delivering code that works 90% of the time uh, to to their customers and 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 again this is this is a a habit a bad habit and a bad anti pattern which is formed in the software quality assurance industry now over decades and DevOps and one of our goal with goals with DevOps is to eliminate this sort of anti pattern and shift left and and focus less on the um, you know, on, on assessing the quality of our software after uh, or shortly before we're going to deliver it, but, you know, improve the quality of our software early on in the delivery life cycle. The, um, in, in, you know, so I mentioned in, in terms of modern software development practices that we, we use the, you know, a, a more reliable test pyramid where we're focusing more on the unit testing stages and integration testing stages. We limit the use of automated UI tests. We will oftentimes, we'll also build test endpoints into our API architecture. And, um, and, and this eliminates some of the some of the, the problems that you see with like automated testing where you know, I, I've seen this time and time again in my, my journeys through the, through the industry, I'll see quality assurance people, they'll, they'll write tests where they will hit some sort of API endpoint and then they will look for a result in a database and they'll, they'll query a database directly to see if the, the, 
the data that was pushed to the endpoint actually ended up in a database table somewhere. And uh, you don't want to you don't want to write tests that are so tightly coupled to your infrastructure resources that, that that makes for very brittle testing. Instead, you would you would prefer to implement the API and, and actually create sort of a test harness that you can leverage to make your testing process easier. And this is quite common in the manufacturing industry, like if a you have companies that build car engines, and they'll actually build an interface in the car engine that can be plugged into a test harness system during the, during the manufacturing process. It makes it easier for them to test the engine on the production line as it's traveling down the, the deployment pipeline, so to speak. In the, in the software world, we can do the same thing. We can build a, a, these test API endpoints that make it easier to connect our test harness to our software platform. And again, we attempt to eliminate those non-deterministic tests in, in our automation process. So non-deterministic, non-deterministic tests uh, will absolutely destroy your platform. Uh, if if you allow them uh, to to exist, and so you either eliminate them altogether, or possibly you quarantine them. You, so you you take those tests which fail at times, and you you put them into a separate quarantine test suite that you might run with with some you know regularity. Maybe you run that that suite once a day or something. And your goal is to try to figure out if you can make the test deterministic. And if you can't, then you need to figure out a way, a different way of testing that particular part of the application. One last thing I'll mention is, a, is another common anti-pattern that I, I see throughout the software development industry. And, and that's where customers are focusing on inspection in order to understand the quality of the software that they're delivering. And they, they do that by creating a special hardening phase. So you can imagine like software developers are working on their, their stories and they're writing code and they, they'll do that for, for like six to eight weeks. And then the organization says that we need to halt all software development and we're in a, you know, a two to four week hardening phase where now everybody's going to be focused on identifying and remediating defects in the, the software code that was delivered. Well, if, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense in a, in a DevOps sort of culture because in a DevOps culture, we're using continuous integration and our software pipeline in our ideal automated testing pyramid to continuously test our software code and give us assurance that the code will run properly when it's deployed into a production environment. So why would we need to sort of stop the production line and you know, and and halt the uh, the production of code for a few weeks to inspect that code to see if it will actually work in production. We we should have convinced ourselves a long time ago that our software will work because it's been flowing through a continuous delivery pipeline. The the, the hardening phase. Companies that implement a hardening phase. Um, you know, are, are following a, a traditional software development uh, methodology where the, the code is going to be actually tested. The quality of the code is going to be tested as it comes off the production line, not while it's on the production line. And I, I tend to find that companies that are following this sort of anti-pattern are producing lower quality code. They're... Um, producing code that is is riskier and they're oftentimes also increasing their batch sizes because they're artificially introducing these delays in their software 
delivery process. And so that just allows more work to queue up in larger batch sizes, which are deployed into a production environment.